Rover. The British institution that, in its 100-year history, created cars like the P6 and P5. Two automotive juggernauts that were some of the best in their class. Setting the tempo for future generations of saloons. Mismanagement, strikes and poor judgement would bring Rover to its knees. And after 100 years, the mark that was once described as creating some of Britain's finest cars was gone. There are some Rover cars that are lost to time, some that never made it, through poor decisions, industry strife, and some that were simply too little, too late. This is the story of the forgotten Rover prototypes and concepts, like the Rover 700, a futuristic replacement for the 800 to reignite confidence in the brand, and the Rover Odin, an MPV years ahead of the competition. Hello everybody and welcome to this video. If you're not subscribed already, please make sure to do so. It really does help me out and you get to see more of this. More cool conversions, more prototypes, more car reviews soon, and more interesting projects like 2600R and my Rover SD1. This video is on some of the most incredible prototypes, concepts, and projects that Rover ever produced. Make sure to drop a like on the video if you liked it. Drop a comment below. What is your favourite one of these? Do you think any of them would have succeeded? And what would you have done potentially differently? But without further delay, let's get into the video on the incredible missing Rovers. The Rover 700 or R16. The 80s and Rover were a troubling time. Back in private ownership, the Rover 800 had failed to capture the market like the company had hoped. Thanks partially to the backstabbing of Honda, but more of that in another video. When the Rover 800 was launched in 1986 by Austin Rover, the team that designed it had specified to management it would only have a shelf life of around 5 years, and that was their initial intention. But thanks to the privatisation of 1988 resulting in the entire operation being sold to British Aerospace, Rover was restrained by cash issues. And because of this, Rover wasn't given the resources needed, but that wouldn't deter them from trying. Richard Hamblin's team set to work on this new Rover, but instead of a facelift, it would be a completely new car, based on a stretched version of the Rover 800 platform. The project in 1988 would be named R16, with its development running alongside the R17 facelift for the Rover 800. The car's design progressed into a sleek new version of the 800, an executive express for the 90s with an aggressive front end, new grille, smaller, more dynamic lights, and a bulging bonnet. A full-scale model emerged with the 800 sterling wheels, but sadly, as usual, this was another opportunity that Rover would miss. Strangled by a lack of cash for new models, Rover would have to fall back to their old tricks on the R17, the cheapest proposal rather than the best one, continuing the Rover 800's long saga until 1999. The Rover 700 or R16 was later destroyed, confining another car that could have helped define a new decade for Rover to the big pile of what-ifs that have plagued the company's troubled later history. The Rover 425 LE V6 Rover's 400, penned by Richard Woolley, responsible for the company's later offering the Rover 75, would be the last model co-developed with Honda. This new model was intended to replace the legendary and best-selling Rover R8 model range, but ended up falling short thanks to difficulties within the project, resulting in the Rover 400 being overpriced according to publications at the time. The model sadly was not very profitable either, with the majority of the profits from each model sold being paid to Honda in royalties. The Rover 400 though would have its day in the spotlight thanks to this mysterious model, the 425 LE. In 1995 the project for this car was kicked off, installing a KV6 into the new 400. With exclusive wheels, a retrimmed cabin, the new 400 would be turned into a mid-sized express. Sadly though, at the time, some KV6400 test cars were being evaluated and the results weren't good. Cooling issues resulting in overheating and at worst, complete failure was becoming common among the test fleet. Internally, it was debated whether or not this car would be launched as a limited run of 500 cars. The car debuted at the 1997 Frankfurt Motor Show, but only as a design concept, thanks to their engineering issues plaguing the prototype fleet only two 425 LEs were produced. If launched, the car would have sat comfortably next to its smaller brother, the 200 BRM, as part of Rover Group's performance portfolio. The Rover Odin. The Land Rover Freelander, or CB40 as it was known during its project phase, had an interesting development story. 
Starting out as an idea to produce a lifestyle vehicle in the late 80s, the Freelander wouldn't start off as the Freelander though. It would be split into two cars, the Rover Odin and the Land Rover Pathfinder. These cars were developed thanks to the help of a familiar friend, the Austin Maestro van. 25 of these incredible oddities were painted in either cream or black with fake fuel filler necks and older registrations to deceive the competition. These Austin Maestros weren't normal vans though, they were based on the new Freelander or Pathfinder platform. These cars would be used to test this new platform in utter secrecy, but of course it's hard to hide a four-wheel drive platform on an Austin Maestro. At the time, cars like the Suzuki Vitara were selling well, and everyone else wanted a piece of the action. Therefore, Rover developed this in complete secrecy. By the mid-90s, two models had emerged, the Land Rover Pathfinder and the Rover Odin. The Rover Odin would share styling motifs with the current family of Rovers. The two proposed cars would come in either two or four door versions, with either model available in front wheel drive or four wheel drive, with the two wheel drive versions using the Maestro slash R3 style rear suspension. Sadly at the time the Rover name wasn't exactly one attracting much investment, especially from its parent company British Aerospace. Therefore the board's decision was an easy one, the Rover Odin was dropped, and the Land Rover CB40 project progressed, with it eventually resulting in the big hippo we all know today, the Land Rover Freelander. The Rover 800 Long Wheelbase The Rover 800 launched in the mid-80s was a complete departure from what came before it, the Rover SD1. Gone were the big V8s of the old Rovers, these were replaced by the V6s from Honda, the C27A. Gone was the rear wheel drive, this would be replaced with the transverse front wheel drive setup. The Sterling was pitched as the top of the range, but two years before its launch in 1984 the design team at Canley would design another 800, one with a long wheelbase. Sadly with the Rover 800 project already experiencing delays and the new XJ40 rumoured to be on its way, it didn't seem that there was much point in developing the long wheelbase further, therefore the project was dropped, leaving the standard wheelbase Sterling as the range topper. Thankfully it wasn't over for the Rover 800's long wheelbase dreams, coach builder Coleman Milne would produce the Vanden Plas version years later, which would be the ultimate in Rover 800 luxury. With 12 inches added to its rear passenger space, it was intended to replace the Daimler DS420 limousine. The new Vanden Plas would include options taken from the Sterling in the US, such as the rear floor console and the walnut trim for the front ashtray. The 800 long wheelbase was only a clay mock-up and would be destroyed after the project's cancellation. It is not known how many Coleman Milne Vanden Plas models were made. The Rover 55 The Rover 55 is one of those mystery rovers that is hard to believe. Grainy renderings and lack of information in general plague this project, but thanks to employees of Rover Group at the time, this mystery is now solved. The Rover 55 was the proposed replacement for the Honda-based Rover 400, which Rover Group, owned by BMW, intended to replace by 2000. In the late 90s, the Rover badge was on everything, even the humble Metro. BMW and Rover knew to survive, they would need to finally pick where they wanted to pitch their offering. They had two options, ditch the Metro 200 and 400 and go full high-end premium or have a three model range. Initially it was decided to go with the fully premium offering. The Rover 55 was created to sit at the bottom of the newly fully premium Rover range and the top end would be occupied by the Rover 75. This would be part of a new dual model policy to move Rover back up market. By the late 90s the project was in its later stages with the engineering teams and designers at Rover hard at work creating the new Rover 55 and finishing off the work on the Rover R40 which would become the Rover 75. The Rover 55 was to be powered by BMW NG engines with both 4 and 6 cylinder options. Two test cars were commissioned known as the long nosed Rover 200s with a proposed running gear for the Rover 55. The reason for the long nose is, these engines were longitudinally mounted, with front wheel drive. The design of the Rover 55 was penned by Richard Woolley, with a clay model completed in Gaydon in the spring of 1997, and a composite model built by Futura, a contract in Birmingham. The car along with the Rover 75 styling model was shipped for a secret photo shoot at Ragley Hall. But then, disaster would strike. By 1999 BMW had slammed on the brakes, 
Internal turmoil and BMW's then decision to take Rover back down market with the Rover R30 project led to the project's cancellation. The models would later be destroyed, but thanks to Jeff Upex, one would survive for a little bit longer. This would be stored at Gaydon until 2005, when it would be destroyed. There is much more that can be said about the world-beating model range that Rover could have had under BMW if things hadn't have gone so badly. A Rover 55 Coupe, a 35 Premium Hatch, and of course the Mini, included with the Rover 75. If you'd like me to cover the future or the lost future of Rover in the 2000s, let me know in the comments below. The Rover R30 has its own video which I've also linked in the description. The Rover 75 2006 Facelift the Rover 75 was the last chance saloon for a company that desperately needed success. After its introduction it would be facelifted slightly in 2002 with smoked lights and new trim and again in 2004 with the Mark II with the new Rover branding and styling. MG Rover in 2004 knew in order to survive they needed new models but without the funds to develop any and no partner to help finance any, Rover were in a predicament. Therefore, it was decided to explore another interim solution, renosing the Rover 75, again. This time, MG Rover designer Lee Mitchell would give it a try, with a new model to be introduced in 2006. This car as pitched to the team, though, wasn't just a Reno's. It incorporated a 103mm stretch to the car's wheelbase to improve the room in the rear. On the inside, the car would get interior changes shown in the early Rover 75 Coupe concept which I also made a video about, including its mysterious fate, linked in the description below. The new Rover 75 would have a new engine, the G-Series, a new engine developed by Powertrain to replace the M47. Only sketches and renderings of the 2006 Rover 75 survive. With the collapse of MG Rover in April of 2005, the project was cancelled before it could even leave the drawing board. The Rover R30 or 35. The biggest mystery of the Rover group, and perhaps a factor that destroyed its relationship with BMW, was the Rover R30, the car on which the Rover Mark's future hinged upon, being a success. The R30, however, would be pillaged after a boardroom fight and allegedly went on to become the BMW 1 Series. After BMW's acquisition of Rover in 1994 and its Honda based lineup, BMW knew to see Rover into the new millennium and beyond, a complete lineup refresh was needed. BMW were also tired of paying the royalty payments on the Honda technology used in this lineup. The proposal consisted of three platforms and four cars, with the four cars playing to the strengths of the Rover brand, premium and British, the new Mini R50, the new flagship Rover, the 75 R40, and the mid-sized family hatchback, the R30 or Rover 35 slash 55, a similar platform share to its current 200 and 400. Under the skin, the R30 was engineered the same as the R50 Mini, not to use the K-Series engine, favouring a mix of low-power BMW M47 diesel engines and the Tri-Tech engines produced in collaboration with Chrysler. The model range for the R30 would consist of the Rover 35 replacing the 200, including an MPV, and the Rover 55 replacing the 400. The R30 would have an adapted version of BMW Z axle at the rear, following the same engineering lead as the R40 or Rover 75. Sadly, with inner turmoil, boardroom battles, and Rover losing £2 million a day, it was decided to cancel the project and sell Rover off. In 2000, as the sell-off commenced, the R30 was in its final stages. BMW did not include this in the sell-off to the Phoenix Consortium and allegedly tried to sell the project back to them in 2001 for £300 million. But the Phoenix 4's overdraft could not stomach this proposition, so they decided to go to Le Mans instead to launch the MG range. BMW then approached China Brilliance, but this was also rejected. What later became of this car is one of the biggest mysteries of the Rover Mark. It is rumoured the R30 became the BMW 1 Series, which apparently is closely based on the R30, with the design from the A-Post back being one of the most noticeable similarities. Even before BMW's takeover of Rover in 1994, BMW's engineers had been exploring the idea of a baby BMW, which of course was changed when BMW plunged its resources into Rover Group. 
It is rumoured that the R30 is still in BMW's headquarters today, but no evidence has been put forward to confirm this. There is a small model of the R30, however, that survives today in the British Motor Museum. The Rover 75 Coupe The Rover 75 Coupe was a model that fans had been dying for. The car designed by Peter Stevens was an absolute beauty, and probably would have taken the coupe market by storm in the mid-2000s. Initially created to impress NAC, which were currently at the time in negotiations with MG Rover to create a partnership, the Rover 75 Coupe would serve as a preview of what was to come. A new interior, with yew wood and tan hide, new gauges. A restyled exterior, with a premium grille from the Rover 75 V8. The coupe was the full package, and was a brilliant celebration of Rover's first 100 years. Sadly though, this car would never be produced. When the company collapsed in 2005, the only coupe ever produced would be sold to NAC, who would remove the badges and brand it as an MG in their flagship showroom. The car after this would be neglected, but thanks to its current owner, the car would be saved in 2018. The car is still around today, but owned by a private individual. I have a full video on the development and history of the Rover 75 Coupe, which I've linked in the description. The world of Rover's missing cars is one of lost opportunity, industry turmoil and tragedy. But it is also a showcase of some incredible cars and designs that could have been, made by some of the most incredible engineers and stylists. Let me know which one of these cars you think would have been successful, and what you'd like me to cover in the next video, including one of these models more in depth. But as always, Thank you for watching, keep watching and remember to subscribe for more of this and I'll see you in the next one.